All right. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A warm and hearty welcome to all our members, friends, and colleagues from the Namibia Scientific Society. We'd also like to extend our welcomes to the representatives of government, media, and the Legal Assistance Center. Furthermore, we'd also like to say a warm and hearty welcome to Ansia Peters and Dr. Natangwe Shafuda, both uh, from UNAMS Namibia Green Hydrogen Research Institute. Thank you for joining us tonight on this panel discussion. To all our members joining tonight on uh, Zoom, please do take note that this uh, will be recorded, so be careful with your comments. <laughs> we also like to say what a thank you to all our sponsors for making these events possible. First and foremost, we want to say thank you to Paratus for giving us a good high fiber, strong fiber connection, um, to Atlas Engineering Solutions for the cameras, and to Minds in Action. We also thank our sponsor, oh, sorry, uh, my name is Kai Kleinguter and I'm a board member of the Namibia Scientific Society. We are one of the oldest civil societies in Namibia with uh, close to a thousand members and we bring fact-based uh, discussions like these to your intention. We'd also just like to point out we are not affiliated to any political party and these are just fact-based discussions that we follow. As green, hy green hydrogen is a topic which finds a lot of interest, we wanted to present the facts and we started with our first presentation by Ansia Peters last week. So today's panel discussion is made up of experts from the scientific, the legal and the financial sector. So I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Dr. Det Detlef, Detlef von Ertzen, um, who is an independent scientific and technical consultant holding a PhD in higher engine, energy nuclear physics and an MBA focusing on finance. Uh, he's a director of VO Consulting, which is a specialized consulting firm in the energy environment and radiation protection sector. He has more than 25 years of experience and has worked on multiple disciplinary teams. So I'd like to welcome him as one of our uh, panel members tonight. On, in the middle is uh, Mrs. Jackie Schultz. Uh, she's a legal consultant um, with more than 20 years of experience. She holds an B Euros LLB and LLM from the University of Pretoria. Uh, she's a, she specialized in um, regulatory industry and has uh, been part of a lot of projects focusing on the energy, petroleum, and communications sector. Jackie has also consult consulted on various projects focusing on f similar industries within the SADC industry. And then on my far left, uh, Mr. Robert McGregor. He's, in se he's a seasoned economist and holds a BCom honors degree in econ economics and he's currently pursuing his LLB degree through, through University of South Africa. Um, he started his career at the Economic Association of Nam Namibia as a researcher and is currently employed by, uh, uh, by Cirrus Capital as an economist. So I want to welcome all of these panelists tonight. And once they've given their statements, the, the floor will be open for debate, discussions, commentaries. This will be held, well, this will be moderated by our CEO, Mrs. Valdi Fritscher. And just to point out, We'd also like to just say that uh, we will hold further discussions on this topic. There will be more uh, stakeholders coming to table uh, within the next week. So on the 23rd of February, we'll hold a discussion with uh, Green H2 uh, Commissioner, Namibia Green Hydrogen Association and uh, NAMPO Associates or um, representatives. So I want to welcome everybody and thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I wasn't quite aware that it is my spot already, but I will take the microphone and do some adjustments. So please bear with me uh, until we have gotten takeoff here. A warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Detlof von Oertzen. Thank you very much for the invitation by the Scientific Society of Namibia. And it is a pleasure for me to speak on the issues, challenges, and opportunities to develop uh, green hydrogen in Namibia. Now, I will be fairly brief tonight, but there is also a background paper that you're welcome to download. I will give some references later. And uh, you, of course, also most more than welcome to be critical of what I say. 
uh, nothing in this debate is a holy cow, and I think a public debate, a critical public debate, is very important. By way of introduction, and I think we are still having some cross-communication here, have you sorted out your matters, or shall I proceed? Thank you. So by way of introduction, ladies and gentlemen, we know today that hydrogen is of considerable interest, so these last uh, 14 to 18 months or so have really seen hydrogen get center stage, particularly after the European Union has formulated its hydrogen strategy, and it is certainly seen as one of the contributors to uh, a cleaner energy future. Now, Namibia is not uh, taking a back seat here, and uh, it is interesting to note that in the Harambe Prosperity Plan, we do in fact have, uh, ma ma there is a mention of this, namely the Southern Corridor Development Initiative. So you will see on that graph there that this is basically an initiative that uh, foreshadows the development of green hydrogen uh, synthesis there by way of renewable energies, uh, mostly wind and uh, solar photovoltaic. Uh, then in this picture, you will see a boat sort of leaving from the port of Lüderitz, which is uh, loaded with hydrogen. Uh, you know, that narrative is now changing quickly. We all realize that the transport of hydrogen is uh, difficult. But nevertheless, you know, that idea is uh, developed in and uh, introduced in the Harambe Prosperity Plan. So much so that, in fact, uh, at COP26, um, a few months ago in uh, Glasgow, the president announced a, a winner of a request for proposal, namely hyphen hydrogen energy. And uh, in terms of their two concession areas, namely the Springbok and the uh, Dolphin area that you will see South of Lüderitz, this is a very significant piece of land uh, area there. These form part of the future concession area. Now, the thought is that Hyphen Energy will have a period of about two years to come up with their proper plan. Uh, they have developed a uh, bid that was successful in terms of the request for proposal, but of course, the details are not yet known. And uh, that will then be uh, submitted to government. And if successful, then they would embark on the development of hydrogen infrastructure and also the development of uh, green ammonia and other things for shipment, mainly uh, overseas. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a new phase in Namibia's energy landscape. Uh, it is also a rather surprising uh, development, I find, because we are suddenly suggesting that a very substantial piece of a national park is going to be given away on concession, uh, on a concession basis for 40 years. I want to remind you that this area has been a protected area. It is was the Sperrgebiet for a very long time. It was a protected area and, and it is known to house uh, plant and animal species that are absolutely unique. And so this is one of the many uh, aspects that I think we need to have a firm grip on in terms of where this development will take us. So you're most welcome to then discuss this later. I just want to mention this by way of introduction. Now, we also have seen and heard in the press and the media a number of inflationary statements about, you know, what this green hydrogen initiative will bring and the number of jobs it will create and the wealth that it will create. And, uh, you know, it's quite similar to the current uh, discussions about finding oil and, you know, the first politicians running up to stake their claim in this oil, even though we haven't even proven whether it's a viable resource or not. Now, uh, this is, of course, questionable. I find that these inflationary uh, statements are also not very useful because they create an environment in which expectations are raised that we will very likely not be able to meet, despite, 
you know, these numerous pronouncements. We should also be very clear that if we are to bring and introduce a chemical industry in the south of Namibia, in the Tsaukai Park, you know, that will change that area forever. It, the footprint of, a, of the chemical industry may seem benign in terms of the hydrogen and the ammonia uh, synthesis that is going to take place there, but it is, after all, a chemical industry. And so this is, you know, far away from the soft, soft tourism concession approaches that we have seen in the past and the diamond mining approaches that we have, of course, seen in most of the Sperrgebiet for, you know, many, many decades. But let us first take a step back in terms of understanding where all this hype comes from. Now, you know, there is a catchword, it is called global decarbonization. And basically, it is our realization that the increase of man-made greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide, methane, um, water vapor, and so forth, is increasingly becoming a challenge. It is an international challenge. It's not a Namibian challenge. It's not a German challenge or whatever. It is an international challenge and climate change is with us, with us. And it is very obvious that we need to do something about it. Now there is an international body, the uh, International Panel for Climate Change, IPCC. And they foreshadow a route of development whereby deep cuts need to be made in our use of fossil fuels so that we can rapidly reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And so this has far ranging implications for the transport sector, for the energy sector, for the agricultural sector, etc. Very, very substantial implications are indeed uh, have to be taken. And so, you know, if we are to embark on a greener future where less greenhouse gases are going to be emitted, ladies and gentlemen, there is absolutely no doubt that a global transition is required so that we can actually start tackling this problem. And tackling means especially phasing out fossil fuels and associated uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, in this debate, in terms of how best to meet a future that is basically carbon free, there are many different ideas and scenarios. And one of the attractive options that has been muted in this respect is the use of green hydrogen. Now, green hydrogen is a really cute substance it and i will you know let me go to my next slide to say a few words by way of introduction about hydrogen and green hydrogen now the hydrogen is a very interesting element it is also the lightest element in our periodic table of the elements very, very simple structure, a proton in the center, an electron around it. So it is a very simple atom. It is the simplest atom. So physics students train on hydrogen to understand quantum mechanics and these type of things. Lovely stuff. It is also the most abundant element in the known universe. If I say known universe, that's the universe that we see with our telescopes, with our naked eyes. It is the twinkle in the stars that is basically coming from hydrogen being burned to all sorts of other elements. However, the combination of two hydrogen atoms, which we then call molecular hydrogen, you know, molecular hydrogen is not abundant, even though there's a lot of water on Earth and there is a lot of um, hydrogen, there are a lot of hydrogen compounds on Earth, but molecular hydrogen in the form of H2, so two hydrogen atoms fused together is rare. Now, there are claims of certain fines, particularly in hydrocarbon fields, where we can tap and find molecular hydrogen, but generally it is not seen as a viable option for the extraction thereof. So we have to make hydrogen. Now, for years, hydrogen has in fact been made and industry consumes about 90 million tons per annum. That was in 2020. Uh, that is just an order of magnitude figure, just to indicate that it is not a new substance or so. 
It is used particularly in the steel industry, in the chemical industry, in the oil industry. And increasingly, it is also, if it is uh, carrying less carbon or if its origin uh, is associated with less carbon production, then it is, in fact, also used in the steel industry. Now, you know, when I talk about containing less carbon, let me explain what it is that I'm talking about. Now, traditionally, when we synthesize hydrogen, we use uh, simple natural gases such as methane or so and crack them under usually under high temperatures and basically then take the hydrogen from the carbon molecules to then do uh, to synthesize hydrogen. In that process, ladies and gentlemen, you get hydrogen, but you also get copious amounts of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. So, you know, the traditional method of carbon um, or in the traditional method rather of hydrogen synthesis by way of, you know, deriving it from gas or from coal or so is cheap. The industry knows how to do it, but it has this carbon problem. And uh, so that is, of course, you know, we cannot fix the future if we, you know, bank on, on hydrogen that is not manufactured clean, in a clean way, without causing uh, carbon emissions. And that is really, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is really a, an important point to realize that if we want to use and clean up industry, particularly in those so-called hard to abate sectors that would be you know the steel sector the cement sector chemical industries if we want to displace the hydrogen that is currently being used by green hydrogen then we would need to in fact generate green hydrogen and the way to generate green hydrogen is for example by splitting water using electrolysis and the electrolysis product, um, process would be powered by renewable energies that do not emit or have carbon emissions. Now, it is very important to note, therefore, that if we synthesize hydrogen, ladies and gentlemen, then we are creating a fuel, uh, a fuel like many other fuels, and it has very many desirable quantities. But the essence of synthesizing that fuel, colleagues, lies in the fact that it is energetically expensive to do so. So you need to spend much more energy to make hydrogen than you can ever get from it. So this is not because, you know, engineers are incapable, but it is because of the laws of physics and chemistry, which simply make it impossible that we crack chemical compounds and basically find something that generates more energy than the compound itself. So hydrogen is a fuel. It is a wonderful fuel. Green hydrogen in particular is a very clean fuel. It is a very energy dense fuel, but it is a non-trivial fuel. If you want to really have a kilogram of hydrogen, you better com compact it by compression. And it is, comes with its own set of challenges. Let me not go into the technical details, but it is a non-trivial product. But ladies and gentlemen, there are also quite a number of derivative products that we can use if we have green hydrogen. And the derivatives are, for example, green ammonia. Now, ammonia is a substance which contains one atom of nitrogen and three atoms of hydrogen. So the chemical formula for, for those chemical aficionados is NH3. So green ammonia is, some, is ammonia that is synthesized or made from green hydrogen. And ammonia is something that we have already been using in certain uh, internal combustion engines. We have used ammonia to transport it if we want to use or crack it open to then regather the hydrogen from it. So it is a rather versatile element that can store hydrogen that is quite easily transportable, unlike hydrogen. And so there are many benefits of ammonia, but ammonia is also not quite a trivial substance because it is rather aggressive. 
So if we inhale ammonia, it is very bad for our lungs. It is a marine pollutant, etc. So it is a not, not a trivial little substance. And that is the story that I said, if we start building a chemical industry or industrial complex in Sao Kaip, that area where that plant is going to be will be a chemical industrial complex and no longer a biodiversity hotspot or whatever else it may be used for. Ladies and gentlemen, there are um, certain ideas that hyphen hydrogen energy has in terms of what they want to build in Namibia. Now, because these plans are still fluid, I have chosen to rather show you a plant that is envisaged by Total Erin in Chile. So like Namibia, Chile has vast areas that have fantastic solar, re fantastic solar regime. And therefore, you know, these areas are quite suitable in terms of uh, cheap production of hydrogen. And so a typical um, plant hydrogen and ammonia plant would look something like this here. You have in the distance, you may be able to see some windmills. So these are wind energy converters to generate electricity. You may not be able to see the photovoltaic plants, but they are also there. You then have some areas, the so-called base camp where staff stay. You have then a electrolyzer uh, assembly where by way of electrolysis, this hydrogen is generated from the green electricity from wind and solar. You then have a air conversion plant which converts by way of the Harbor Bosch process, this, uh, this green hydrogen into green ammonia. You then have various storage devices and storage tanks, et cetera, et cetera uh, as well as a shipment jetty for the export of uh, ammonia and or hydrogen. So this is, this is typically how such a plant looks like and that footprint is large. It is, it is a large footprint, especially the footprint from the renewable energies, namely, the wind energy converters and also the photovoltaics. I'm not saying that this is exactly how hyphen hydrogen energy's plant will look like, but it is very likely to look very similar. So let us now then go into the question, and that is, you know, is green hydrogen something for Namibia? And I will try to be as neutral as possible. So first of all, if you want to do something in terms of cheap hydrogen synthesis, you need to have cheap energies in the form of solar energy and wind energy. So you need an abundance of renewable energies. Now, let me show you this map here, which is a map of Namibia that shows the global uh, horizontal irradiation. That is the sunshine that is of use if you have a photovoltaic plant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you are seeing here is one of the best solar regimes that we have. There are certain spots in the world that have a better regime, but overall, this potential that we have in solar is tremendous. And so while I don't want to, you know, fall into this uh, exuberance phase, this is really something to be exuberant about. Let me illustrate just by way of a little trivial example. You may see the little blob that I show you. So let me show this little blob here. And that little blob, sorry, if I can just get this thing to go. Sorry, this is not yet. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, what I first want to refer to is this little blob. I apologize, we have a slight little problem here. It seems that it is just going on and on. We will eventually figure it out. 
and sometimes it does take longer than you would think it does, but we are now at the right stage. So here we have this global horizontal irradiation regime. You have this tiny square there. And you know, if you were to plaster that tiny square with solar photovoltaics, you would generate on average every year 3.4 terawatt hours. Now, just by way of explanation, a terawatt hour is a billion kilowatt hour. So you at home, you may have a sort of average monthly consumption of electrical energy between 200 and 600 kilowatt hours. And so Namibia have in the financial year 2020, 2021, have consumed about 3.4 terawatt hours in terms of electrical energy. So this tiny little speck there, ladies and gentlemen, would in principle provide you with our solar regime, the entire electrical energy that this country uses. But it is of course important to know that some 67% of our electrical energy is still uh, imported from South Africa and the region. So, you know, we are not here, that year, yet there in terms of supplying sufficient electrical energy for Namibia. But this is by way of illustration of this vast potential that we have. Now I want to go a step further. You will see the next little blob there, this little yellow uh, blob. And that yellow blob would allow you to plaster it with a um, electrical capacity of about 10 gigawatt in terms of photovoltaic capacity to generate electricity. If we were to do so, and this is just for illustration purposes, it, it is not something that we should do or that I recommend, it is just to illustrate the orders of magnitude here, ladies and gentlemen. If we were to plaster this with photovoltaics, that little spot there, and if some 10 gigawatts of capacity would be installed, we could then generate the total energy that Namibia consumes in one year, which is about 22 terawatt hours in a year. So all our liquid fuels, that is the diesel, the petrol, et cetera, that we use, all electricity, all biomass, everything that we use in terms of energy would in principle be the same as you could generate from a 10 gigawatt farm of that size. As I said, this is for illustration. It is not to say that, you know, we can just displace these various energy forms with solar electricity. You know, there are many complications, but it is just illustrating that we have a fantastic solar re resource in Namibia. Now, let me now go to the wind part. The wind part, ladies and gentlemen, is this slide on the right-hand side or the picture on the right-hand side, which is the wind energy density at 100 meters hub height. So if you had a wind energy converter at 100 meters, then you would have these type of typical um, values there. And I have, a, again, a little square. If you look closely in the left-hand lower um, side, you have a little square there. And that little square, if you were to plaster it with wind turbines, again, of 10 gigawatt, then, ladies and gentlemen, that small area, that high wind area would be sufficient to power 10 gigawatt of capacity, wind energy capacity, and that would generate about twice as much in terms of total energy than the entire Namibia consumes in a year, not just electrical, all energy. So this is vast, ladies and gentlemen, the potential that we have sitting in our solar and our wind resources is enormous. So the question is, do we have abundant resource potentials in terms of renewables? No doubt about it. We have one of the best regimes. Question is, do we have large underused tracts of land? Well, you know, if, if I look around, I would say, yes, we have, but of course we have many patches that have, that are important for a variety of reasons, not only for agricultural purposes, 
but also for biodiversity conservation purposes and many others. So, you know, while I believe that we have large tracts of land, it is nevertheless a sensitive issue to, to demarcate and to permit land for long-term purposes for the use of renewables. But in principle, I believe we have land, plenty of it. Ladies and gentlemen, then the question is, of course, if you have lots of resource pot potential to generate electricity, do we actually have low cost electricity in Namibia? And the answer is no. Our local electricity at the moment is amongst the highest in the SADC region, but that has, the reason for this is not because we may not be doing our job correctly, but the government decision has been that our tariffs for electricity need to be cost reflective. That means we have to pay what it costs to, ge to generate. So, you know, comparing Namibia's electricity tariffs, which are very high to some of the neighboring countries, we find they have much lower tariffs. Why? Because they are subsidized by government, as simple as that. But we have the potential, especially if we invest significant resources into our renewables, we have the potential to generate very cheap electricity in the long term. Now, clearly, if you want to have hydrogen and you want to generate hydrogen by way of synthesis, electrolysis, that is, you need water. And, you know, we don't have water in Namibia. It is, Namibia is a country classified as a country of extreme water scarcity. It's not a new thing. We all know about it. But of course, we have the Atlantic Ocean, and I think there is absolutely no doubt that with modern desalination techniques, we have a completely untapped resource exactly next to us to actually power the or provide the water that we would require for uh, the production of uh, green hydrogen. So while it is expensive, and while you need uh, while you need to desalinate seawater to produce the clean water, you nevertheless would find that there is really no scarcity if you're provided to go the desalination route. Now, the question then is, does Namibia have any production facilities in terms of hydrogen or processing facilities? I can be brief. No, we don't. Nothing of this is in existence, except you know a couple of school labs or so who have a little hydrogen generator, which is rather trivial to do by way of electrolysis or so, but we do not have any of this infrastructure. So if we want to become this African hydrogen hub, as is you know, often mentioned, or even the hub to the world and you know, other um, big, big uh, mouths uh, expressions, then of course we would have to put in place all this. And of course an investor could certainly do so. Do we have the human capital, uh, capacity and do we have the funding for it? Well, if we don't have funds ourselves, we can surely find somebody, if it is such a hot product, to, to finance it. Clearly, it does come with strings. Do we have the human capital? Well, I think Anisha Peters has uh, beautifully explained that it is not an overnight process to develop scientists and or engineers for that matter. Um, and so, therefore, the human capital question is, especially if we are in a hurry, it is a very, very significant issue. And, of course, the question is, do we have markets in Namibia for hydrogen or for green ammonium and so? We could, in time, develop markets, say, in the mining sector. Um, I have Mark Dor right sitting here. So let's talk to Mark about, you know, green hydrogen at B2 Gold. I mean, they have the funding, they could roll it in, but it will take time. We have Deb Marine and Namdeb in southern Namibia, and they could become anchor clients for it. We have Usop and we have Sak we have Usop and Rosing in the Irongo region, and they could in time become small off takers of green hydrogen, provided the price is reasonable. But at the moment, we don't have any local offtake. So this product would definitely be mainly for export, mainly to international clients, and would not, and most of it would not remain in the region. So let me talk a little bit about challenges and risks, and I will be fairly, fairly short. 
I make reference to a paper that was sponsored by the uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, I have seen Mrs. Rusman is right here. Uh, so thank you very much again. So the Karl, um, the, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung um, and myself have collaborated for in the energy field for, for many, many years on a variety of publications. And you can download this particular paper there at this link of my company, but you can also download it, of course, from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung free of charge. And I may also ask, you also have hard copies still available, don't you? Yeah. So visit the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and pick up a, a copy or do it electronically that is more environmentally benign. So we are now on the page in terms of challenges and risks. And ladies and gentlemen, my first uh, question is always, when you have a large project undertaking, do you understand what you are giving up? Do you have an idea of the next best alternatives? To me, this is a critical question. I am not entirely sure that we actually have an idea of what the alternatives really are. We have this one Southern Corridor Development Initiative. We have a single bidder who is now preparing something. But I must confess that I am bit, a bit uneasy because it is very difficult to weigh up the pros and cons of a far-reaching decision such as this one when I do not know what the next best alternatives are. Ladies and gentlemen, the investor promises an investment over a couple of years of 10 billion US dollars. That is more or less the size of the Namibian economy. So this is in, you know, let me be quite frank. This is an investment tsunami that is coming along. You know, so this is for a small country such as Namibia that has a very limited absorptive capacity, both in terms of institutions, in terms of manpower, etc. This is a challenge. frame for hyphen hydrogen says that we will have hydrogen production by 2026. Incidentally, that's the same date that is mentioned with the light oil find a couple of days ago by Shell and um, Qatar. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we also have a Namibian development agenda. At least I am, I believe we have such an agenda. And we have certain national needs in terms of what it is that we would need to be doing so as to uplift this country. I am unsure about how this particular mega project is going to fit into this development agenda of ours. In particular, how jobs are going to be created how people are going to be lifted out of poverty, how, in fact, we are going to strengthen our food supply, our water supply, so this energy, food, and uh, water nexus that we have in Namibia, that plagues us all along. These three things have always been our weak parts. We don't have enough water, we don't have enough energy, and we don't have enough food. We need to strengthen these three things together. I'm not entirely sure how that project actually would want to do that. I'm also very skeptical, ladies and gentlemen, let me be frank about this. I work as an independent consultant and I have several clients right now who I accompany in terms of green hydrogen projects. I also am worried when I hear about development that takes place in national, park, in national parks. Uh, so we have national park development. Um, I'm thinking about the various mining operations in, in the Orongo region that uh, touch on or are in the park. And, you know, this particular initiative, the Southern Corridor Development Initiative, takes place smack bang in the Tsaukai Park, the Sperrgebiet, that is one of the last remaining pristine biodiversity places in Namibia. 
it has benefited and it has this biodiversity because it has been blocked basically for public access for such extended period. So that is something where we need to be very clear about what it is that we give up if we are to embark on the erection of a hydrogen um, industry. Something that I have uh, advocated again and again, and we have very good experiences with that is, have we studied the strategic impacts in terms of a stra strategic environmental assessment? Now, in the Irongo region, ladies and gentlemen, we had exactly such an assessment in 2010, 2011, um, when the Ministry of Mines and Energy, together with the German Bundesanstalt für Geowissenschaften and Resources, I believe, is their um, BGR. We did this assessment. We have a representative of this company right here in the audience. And it was a very successful ex um, strategic assessment for the simple reason that, you know, at the time we were expecting a uranium rush to happen in a Rongo region and we all scratched our heads and we, are, we were asking ourselves, so what are the cumulative impacts that all these developments will bring to the, to the region of Irongo? And so while this uranium rush was put to an end with Fukushima happening, it was nevertheless a very, very helpful exercise to, to systematically think through the challenges that we have when we embark on multiple large project initiatives. And so I would be extremely happy if we had such a strategic environmental assessment done so that we can understand the weak spots that we have and what it is that we need to do to strengthen this so that we can actually benefit from this idea. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue is very straightforward. If we do not have sufficient adaptive capacity in Namibia for a mega project, the project may still go ahead. And I've personally worked in these enclaves in Mali and Tanzania where you fly in as, as an expat, you know, it's all expenses paid. It is beautiful. You go into these compounds, you work there for a couple of weeks, and you fly out. You know, you wouldn't know that you are in Mali or you wouldn't know that you are, in fact, in Tanzania. Because these are extremely well-managed operations. So you can manage enclaves very well. But the question that I have, is it that we would we really want to have enclave development in Namibia where we have this fly in fly out expat movement or do we want to bootstrap ourselves into development by projects now i certainly would say we have not really had a level headed assessment of the forces that will become active when such a large project lands. That's why I talk about a investment tsunami. And I'm thinking also about, you know, the local authorities in, in Lüderitz, in Oranjemund, in a structurally rather weak area. So are we saying that structurally these areas would simply be able to absorb tens of thousands of workers and an influx of, you know, a, a large number of goods and services just like that. It's not possible. We need to actively strengthen the absorptive capacity. But first of all, we need to understand what it is that we would really require. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm almost done. So uh, you will be relieved to hear uh, that I will stop uh, in, in a minute's time or so. I believe that we are very much at a point where we can play a meaningful role in the global energy transition. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the pace and the international drivers that are at work may often be too fast or go into a direction that is not really well attuned to what Namibia can best accommodate. And that is a problem that I have with this and I see it as a risk and I see it as a challenge. So let me come to the, to the conclusions then. Very straightforward, not a lot of ranting from my side. First of all, I just want to stress again 
that we have this enormous renewable energy potential out there. It would be fantastic to use that potential to bootstrap Namibia's development for future, for the future. So, you know, that can certainly power us into the future. So that means that if we were to invest significantly and upscale our energy industry, particularly the electricity industry in terms of investments in renewables, that will all do us good. Particularly noting that we are still a net importer of 67% of electricity and all our liquid fuel. So we are a significant importer of, of these uh, energy resources. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that hydrogen, green hydrogen in particular, holds many potentials, including for Namibia. But I believe that the irrational exuberance that we sometimes see and hear about, uh, particularly you know, by people who are paid to talk up these things, is something that is not really reflective of the actual capacity to bring business to Namibia. And so I have a, I'm reserved about this and I'm worried about it because it creates these international expectations. You know, in December, I read a story in the Wall Street Journal about Namibia's hydrogen potential as if it is already a reality. So, you know, it's fantastic if, an, if a country is mentioned in the international press and it is not in relation to, you know, the gas crisis in Europe and all these other things. So it's nice to be there. But ladies and gentlemen, I would also think that some, a more humble approach about what we really can and what, what our trajectory is would do us much better. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm also worried that our local development imperatives, if we can call it that, what is important to get going here? And I mentioned before this water, energy, and food nexus. You know, those three things that we need to strengthen. Do these international agendas do and requirements in terms of fast delivery of large quantities of hydrogen, do they actually match local requirements and local imperatives? And I am reserved about this. Frankly now, and I'm going to be very unpopular once again with it, I'm also not of the opin opinion that if you outsource your development pathway to commercial developers, that this will necessarily result in, in outcomes that will be optimal for Namibia. So what is, what is this big talk about? What do I mean? Ladies and gentlemen, the consortium has two years to come up with a um, plan in terms um, of how they want to realize this and they, by then, would be probably in the financial due diligence phase in terms of 10 billion US dollars. So, you know, even for a person like Mark, it is a significant amount of dough. You know, so we all know that, you know, he carries around the big stacks of gold. But this is a lot of dough. And what I'm saying is that if you go and negotiate, and you have only one bidder to negotiate with, and you suddenly negotiate with a bidder that has 10 billion US dollar, US dollar investment. And then comes the phase where you say, so what is the bottom line? What will you give and what will we give? Then I believe we have created an unnaturally strong leverage for the investor that will not do us good. Leverage in terms of negotiating what is best for Namibia versus what is in the interest of the investor. It is something that keeps me awake, even though I am not even working for that consortium. So ladies and gentlemen, I need to say something that will get my blood pressure under control again. And I would say it is very important that we begin to be fact-based about things, that the irrational exuberant and these inflationary stories that we hear are toned down and that a sense of realism comes in into asking what is it that we need to do so that we can benefit from this leap into green hydrogen which holds many opportunities particularly because it makes so much sense to do so in a 
country that is drenched in sun and in wind. At the same time, let us not provide leverage to those who are mere investors and who may not have the same views that we have in terms of Namibia's development. I would want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That is what I have to say for the moment. Please be critical with what I have said. You are welcome to ask any question. And I would want to hand over, Valdi, is that correct? I hand over directly to Jackie. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. von Oertzen, for this very, very informative presentation. I think there's a lot of questions, but I do ask everybody just to wait with your questions till the end of the panel statements or by experts. Um, speaking about energy, there is a car, a Nissan MP300 with registration number N16. 946W, your lights are still on, so maybe um, I'll just repeat that. That is a Nissan MP300 with registration number N16946W, your lights are still on. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so I also just like to introduce uh, Dr. Natunga Sh Sh Natangwe Shafuda. He is one of the members of the uh, UNAM Namibia Green Hydrogen Research Institutions. He joined us a bit later, but he is here tonight. So thank you very much for joining us. With that, I would like to hand over to our next um, expert, um, Jackie Schultz, and she'll be speaking about the legal and well regulatory frameworks in this, uh, with this regard. Thank you very much. Yes, is it working? Good. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Jackie Schultz, and I'm a legal consultant, and I specialize, amongst others, in the energy sector in Namibia. Um, I did not prepare a presentation because I was a bit pressed for time, so I'm just going to give a presentation from, from my notes. And I'm not going to focus on this specific project. I'm going to focus on what is the regulatory framework that a hydrogen project would be operating in, in Namibia. So both our national policies as well as what possible legislation will be applicable to a project of this nature. My presentation is not very long because the legal framework is quite flimsy. I want to start off and just quote from our national policies, um, which is quite overarching and flexible and accommodating of these kind of new technologies uh, where our legislation might take some time to catch up. I think what we've also seen with the COVID two years that we've got behind us, that it is sometimes very, uh, it takes a long time for legislation to go through parliament. So from the national energy policy, which dates from 2019, uh, the main goals are to ensure the secur security of all relevant energy supplies to the country, to create cost-effective, affordable, reliable and equitable access to energy for all Namibians to promote the efficient use of all forms of energy and to incentivize and the discovery, development and productive use of the country's diverse energy sources. Then we went, then I just want to quickly stand still also on the National Renewable Energy Policy, which dates from 2017. Um, Dietlof and I had earlier just a quick discussion. Uh, hydrogen is not specifically mentioned. We thought it was, but we, we can't find it. But it doesn't matter if it's not specifically mentioned. The policy is, is overarching sufficiently to accommodate uh, all kind of new kinds of technologies and to create a framework within which we can create regulatory frameworks based on our policy. So the overarching mission of Namibia's national renewable energy policy is to enable access to modern, clean, environmentally sustainable and affordable energy services for all Namibians. The policy aims to make renewable energy a powerful tool for the government of Namibia to meet its short-term and long-term national development goals and to assist Namibians to climb the development ladder 
empowered by access to energy at all levels that facilitate engagement in productive uh, activity. Additionally, the policy's vision is for Namibians to become a regional lead leader, for, sorry, for Namibia to become a regional leader in the development and deployment of renewable energy within Southern Africa. So there we have now our national policies. And then I'm just going to briefly look at the various legislation that would be applicable to a project of this nature. The first one is the Petroleum Products and Energy Act, which dates from 1991. It's one of the first laws that Namibia adopted or promulgated subsequent to independence, but it's mainly uh, based on the South African version. And the South African uh, version dated from apartheid years where there were sanctions. So this whole law focuses mainly just on petroleum products and it focuses on savings in petroleum products. Um, again, bearing in mind, it comes from a sanction era. It's basically silent on energy. So the law has become quite outdated. Where are we now? 20 years later, 1991. Or 30 years? 20. 20. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. <laughs> so there's been some talk for some time now to um, split the law, the Petroleum Products and Energy Act, into two parts. One that focuses solely on, solely on petroleum products upstream and downstream, and then have a national overarching law that focuses on energy in general, that will form a framework under which we can then make further legislation or regulations for energy-related projects but um, it's very slow moving. It's just still an idea there. Um, for example, we have an Electricity Act um, that specifically focuses on electricity. So maybe it's time that we unbundle these laws and let them focus on each sector that they deal with. The next law is the Environmental Management Act. Now, if we look at the projects such as uh, green hydropower, then um, it definitely aspects thereof will fall within the ambit of the Environmental Management Act with regard to its listed activities, which means these are activities that you cannot undertake unless you have an environmental clearance certificate and have done an environmental impact assessment. Um, if the project involves the generation of electricity or even the transmission of electricity from the plant to the, um, uh, what do you call it, factory or what they make, then you will need, um, for that, it's a listed activity, you will need an EIA and an environmental clearance certificate. Also, if you extract any natural resource, whether it's regulated or not, it's a listed activity. The release of brine back into the ocean by desalination plants is a listed activity. And the abstraction of ground or surface water for industrial com or commercial purposes is also a listed activity. So you may not necessarily need to do an EIA on your plant itself, but that surrounding activities that you undertake are all listed activities. So you will definitely fall within the ambit of this act. Also, if you have to apply for an electricity license, then one of the requirements for the, for the application and for the electricity control board is that you've done an environmental impact assess assessment. So if you're not gonna pick it up under that act, the ECB will pick you up. Then we have the Electricity Act. So again, if it involves renewable energy um, generation, whether it's wind or solar, it will probably definitely be more than 500 kVA. So even if it's for own use within your plant, if it's more than 500 kVA, you will need a generation license from the Electricity Control Board. But there is the possibility that you can be, you can apply for an exemption. Um, there are, it's not an unregulated exemption. They can, the ECB can put conditions on you if they exempt you. But um, it's a possibility since the generation that you do is for own consumption and own use on your, in your, within your area, your premises. Um, especially also if you're not connected to the national grid and it's a standalone system. I just also here want to mention that um, there is currently a process, uh, there are two new bills. The Electricity Act has been, uh, are going to be replaced by a Namibian Energy Regulatory Authority Act and then a separate Electricity Act. So the Electricity Control Board that currently only focuses on electricity is going to be transformed into an energy regulator. So then any energy source can be allocated to that regulator to regulate. And our, our typical energy sources 
of petroleum products. Um, that is a bit unlikely because of the uh, strategic role petroleum, petrol and diesel plays in our country's economy. So it's highly unlikely that the government will leave the regulation, especially the price regulation thereof to an independent regulator, but maybe the, the licensing system and so on can go to an energy regulator. Then we have um, electricity, and then we have, uh, I think what, what is now in the pipeline is the regulation of gas. But I think with the kudu that has been now put a bit to the sideline, the whole gas bill has become less of a priority. And then definitely also renewable energy. So I would say this is typical, an aspect that will fall under a renewable energy bill I don't think we need to have a separate act for each new energy that, that comes up. So there's some exciting news there in, in, in the energy sector about this um, re-regulation and transformation. I also want to quickly just mention the Public Procurement Act. Basically, what the Public Procurement Act says is that the procurement of any goods or services by a public body must go through the Public Procurement Act processes. However, there is an exemption clause which allows the minister to exempt any project from the Public Procurement Act. Um, again, I'm not an expert on this project. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily gone so far yet. Um, it's just a call for, for proposals. So we'll, we'll see what, what happens there. But it can be quite a lengthy process to go through public procurement in terms of that act. I was also asked to just touch briefly on the type of contractual arrangements that you will have if you produce hydrogen and you are a supplier thereof and you have a buyer. So typically you will have then a hydrogen supply purchase agreement with whoever you are going to sell to. Now in Namibia, there's not really a market for um, internally for hydrogen. So it's quite possible that you will look at the export market that again hydrogen is unregulated so um, it's a willing buyer willing seller contractual issue nobody's going to do regulatory oversight at this point in time on those on those contracts and the parties will be free to negotiate their own terms and conditions but i'm sure that it will be very similar to what we see in the electricity industry with our power um, purchase agreements Lastly, I just want to look briefly at, at consumer issues. Now, unfortunately, in Namibia, we do not have a dedicated Consumer Protection Act like they have in South Africa. So we have bits and pieces that we consumers are protected in different laws, but there's no overarching uh, Consumer Protection Act. But what is very important is that a project like this one do not negatively impact on the Namibians or on the, on the consumers and, and ideally should actually have a benefit for them. Typically what we won't don't want to see is if there is a sort of pressure or uh, agreement by government to assist a certain in, of the infrastructure requirements, the building of transmission or distribution lines, the building of roads, uh, the changes and infrastructure changes to the harbor and that that cost then is passed on to either the, a specific consumer, for example, if they have to build transmission lines, that the electricity consumer then picks up the bill for that infrastructure, or generally the, the taxpayer in general then pay, uh, picks up the, the cost thereof. So that is definitely something that government will have to very clearly think about, that there are no negative impacts on the Namibian consumer and taxpayers. Then I want to conclude. So as you can see, the regulatory framework currently is quite scant and that hydrogen is not, not regulated at the moment. And although our national policies can accommodate the promotion thereof, specific laws and regulations will probably be required for that kind of project because it will definitely have an impact on investor confidence um, whether they want to invest huge amounts of money in an industry where there is no really oversight or regulation so thank you very much for your time Thank you very much, Jackie, for your informative discussion on the legal and uh, regulatory frameworks. I would now like to hand over to our last uh, expert, to um, Robert McGregor, who is going to look at the financial impacts 
for discussion on this project. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks and good evening, everyone. Um, I would not go so far as to call myself an expert on very much, but uh, given the large implications that a project like this has on the Namibian economy, we have considered it for quite a while. We wrote about it briefly last year as well. Um, and so my focus today will be on our thoughts uh, in general on the macro economy and, and some concerns linked to that. Um, I think two important points to bear in mind, firstly, are that this project has been given a very large sort of uh, almost silver bullet uh, light for Namibia's problems. And so I'd like to address that. Um, and then also, again, um, as was mentioned earlier, the sort of time frame linked to this, we speak about it as though it's tomorrow when it's still many years away. And so I'm going to start off just painting a bit of a background on the Namibian economy. And I think that might give a light as to why uh, these two aspects have been so heavily driven or, or rather might be so heavily drawn to the green hydrogen project in particular. So if we just look at the a quick background, you can see very clearly there that the Namibian economy has been in very poor shape for very many years now. You can see very clearly there uh, that from about late 2015, mid 2015, uh, the Namibian economy hit its first sort of speed bump. And since then, we've really been struggling for growth. Uh, you can see from 2015 or 2016 to 2019, growth has remained fairly elusive. Uh, we obviously went into 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic with little in the way of reserves from, from both government and households and the economy in general. Um, and you can see the impact that that had on the economy in 2020 was an 8.5% contraction, the largest on record for Namibia. Uh, and then a very, very slow recovery we've seen since then. So you can see that, that we only saw growth in the second and third quarters of 2021 and then very low considering the almost non-existent base um, from that. From a government perspective, government doesn't have much in the way of, of, of any fiscal firepower. You can see there that uh, from about the early to mid 2010s, uh, government ramped up its expenditure quite rapidly and for the first period revenue matched it. But then you can see that from about 2015 with that first soccer shock, revenue started flatlining and this led us into a position where government was running large deficits um, obviously those deficits need to be funded from somewhere um, and that's caused a lot of issues since then government has tried to bring its spending under control through fiscal consolidation effectively limiting its expenditure and trying to get revenue to grow and that's also why to a large extent government is looking to different avenues uh, for revenue growth uh, and and we see a lot of this sort of mentioned in the green hydrogen you know the corporate taxes paid the royalties dividends and similar uh, the concession fees and and so on um, and so government effectively sits in a very difficult position it cannot directly drive growth and um, hasn't been able to for many years not without uh, severe longer term consequences and then if we look at the namibian consumers in general the households uh, from the demand side of gdp by far the single largest contributor you can see that average household indebtedness is incredibly high in Namibia. It's much higher than many other regions uh, or, or countries even within the region. Um, and that is quite a concern. It means that the average Namibian household is highly indebted. They cannot really look to more debt to fund consumption. Obviously, in a low growth environment, high unemployment, low formal employment, and obvious concerns around wage increases or even just maintaining a wage, um, there's very limited ability for households to really uh, see growth or, or spark growth for the Namibian economy. And that's why for many years we've spoken about investment as sort of, you know, a way to sort of kickstart the Namibian economy. And you can see there that gross fixed capital formation, so overall investment in the economy, has slowed down dramatically since 2014. Now, the 2014 number is, is excessively large, and this is because we had a lot of mining investment taking place during those years. We had three substantial mining projects coming to completion, the Husab uranium mine, B2 Gold, or Chicota mine, as well as the Chudi copper mine. And so a lot of investment inflows there. But what you can see, firstly, is that on the chart on your left, um, mining investment has recovered somewhat um, over the last couple of years, but overall investment is still declining, which is a, a, a very major concern. Um, and then on the chart on the right there, you can see that it's not very much government that's driving investment, but it's been the private sector historically that's driven investment. And you can see that there's a very clear indication that the private sector is not investing in the economy anymore. And this is down to many factors, which include obviously the deteriorating economy, but also in our view, the policy environment we've created. We've seen many much mention of this, uh, sort of the direction that policy has taken over the last seven or eight years, um, the rhetoric around policy and the very obvious state-centric involvement of government um, in these policies, which are very, very concerning. 
we can see that it's very much a domestic issue and not a regional or international issue. You can see that investment as a percent of GDP has been declining very heavily for Namibia. Again, it looks incredibly uh, out of line with the, with the boost we had in 2014 with the mining inflows. Um, but the trend is very concerning. Where the rest of the world is on a more positive trend, we've got a very clear negative trend here in Namibia. And that is definitely down to uh, issues of our own making. If we look at Namibia as an investment jurisdiction, the macroeconomic picture is obviously not very encouraging. Um, and if we look at what you generally consider to start investing, which is start a business in Namibia, Namibia doesn't really compete very well with her neighbors. We have amongst the highest corporate tax rates of all of our neighbors. We're now introducing uh, a dividend withholding tax at 10%, so not the highest within the region, but also uh, increasing the hurdle rate, increasing the effective corporate tax rate, which at the end of the day decreases the returns investors sees um, and therefore might make them want to see a higher return elsewhere, um, which is far more attractive. And so Namibia doesn't face very well as an investment jurisdiction in that perspective. As was mentioned, Namibia has one of the highest uh, electricity tariffs in the region. If you compare to our neighbors and quite a lot higher than most. Um, we have amongst we have the second smallest population, so not much of a market size. And then if you look at the ease of doing business uh, sort of scores and rankings, we perform very poorly. We've got the second worst ranking with, of, of our neighbors. We have the most procedures needed to start a business and it takes the most days to start a business in Namibia. So Namibia doesn't really, from these metrics, uh, spark you as the first place to, to do a massive undertaking, let alone one that's going to be sort of almost doubling the size of the economy. Um, and that's sort of the investment number we see thrown around. So 9.4 billion US dollars for perspective, uh, that 9.4 US billion dollars at today's exchange rate is that uh, sort of greenish line on your right. The size of the Namibian economy of the last couple of years is there in the darker lines on your left. Now, not to confuse, obviously, these investment inflows won't all be in one year, so it's not so easy to, to compare. But I mean, the, the proportion of this investment is massive. It is frankly more investment than Namibia has received from offshore uh, over, than over the last 10 years combined. Um, and so this, the scale there really is, is massive and it, it does draw a lot of questions you know, as to where is all this funding coming from and how easily will it flow into, into Namibia. It's easy to sign papers and, and say we are committing to it, um, but you know, it, it's a very different story once the money actually does start to flow. Um, and that's the big question. So if we do see an investment of this level, obviously, it's going to have substantial economic consequences, We're going to see massive inflows on the balance of payments, it's going to boost Namibia's reserve position quite dramatically, and obviously very large benefits there. But the big question is firstly, if that money does start to flow. On the employment numbers that we see thrown around, so we're just trying to provide some context for them for these figures that we have seen or that have been provided officially. Uh, we're looking at a sort of employment of around up to 15 or close to 15,000 people during the four years of construction. So that's construction related um, employment and then 3000 direct jobs created um, from production um, or the numbers that I believe were, were provided. Uh, to put this into the Namibian context, as of 2018, um, that's the latest labor force data we have, unfortunately. But as of 2018, the entire construction industry in Namibia only employed about 45,000 people. Um, you, you're looking at, uh, at you know, the serv financial services industry employed around 12 to 13,000. Um, so the, the scale of numbers there is quite large and it, it really must be asked, um, you know, it's easy to, to, to put these numbers out, but to see the workings behind them is, is a totally different question. Um, you know, are we looking at simply direct employment or are we looking direct, indirect and induced employment, which is a very different thing as well. Um, and so the, the, the scale is, is simply very, very large and it does frankly, draw more questions than it does provide answers. Um, and that's something we think needs a, a lot more clarification. If we look at the impact on the balance of payments, um, what you're looking at here is net direct investment into Namibia. So foreign direct investment, anything below the line is net investment coming into Namibia, anything above the line is investment going out. And you can see very clearly that for a long time, Namibia has been highly dependent on net direct investment, foreign direct investment coming in. But for a period from 2018 to 2019, we saw net investment outflows. And that's frankly because, yes, we did see sort of um, some, some expected movements there, but also because we saw a huge slowdown in direct investment into Namibia. Um, and in my view, because of the policy environment we've created. If we don't take the net figure, but rather the gross investment inflows, this $9.4 billion in, in today's uh, exchange rate is more than we've seen over this entire period. Um, and so it really is an incredibly large 
number. It's very easy to, to, to say the number, but to put it into context really shows, frankly, how massive it is. Um, and to sort of have that sort of inflow over the next four or five years will have dramatic effects on the Namibian economy and the balance of payments. Um, and the structural changes that investment of this nature will cause are also quite, uh, quite dramatic. Namibia is a net importer. We import far more than we export, and that's not always a bad thing. It, 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 there, there are obviously pros and cons to it, um, but a large proportion of our import bill is on, is, is on energy, both uh, from the energy we consume through uh, our, our power purchase agreements, but also um, our liquid fuels. And obviously, if we had to see a project like this come online, it would completely shift that. We would suddenly see a large um, net export position as well, um, most likely given the, the quantum of exports we see driven there, and suddenly Namibia may be a net exporter. Um, that is very positive for the balance of payments, the hard currency reserves, and obviously Namibia's ability to maintain a currency peg for the RAND. And so that is a very great positive. Um, but again, this is highly dependent on if we actually do see these things come into development. And so I think just to briefly draw things to a conclusion, um, there are a lot of considerations that we feel, you know, a lot of questions that we feel need to be answered. And then so it's very nice and easy to, to speak about a lot of these numbers, but there are a lot of questions that um, need to be addressed. And on the first one of them is in terms of competition. We've seen Namibia very clearly does have the renew renewable energy capacity. We obviously have um, an entire ocean at our disposal for that um, or, or for the for the synthesis. But the big question is, why is Namibia your first investment jurisdiction? We're not the only country that have both the water and the solar radiation available, um, but we face a lot more burdens in terms of the corporate tax rates you pay, the difficulty it is in establishing a business in this country in the first place, um, the potential for other nations to subsidize such industries, for instance, your petro states who are looking to, pr to provide a greener picture for themselves. Um, and frankly, we don't have that ability. So it's not to say that Namibia isn't a worthwhile investment place. Um, it's simply to say that Namibia um, is competing on a global scale. Um, and that really is something that needs to be, be brought to mind. Um, another question for us, frankly, is um, on the alternatives, as was mentioned earlier. Um, Green hydrogen has alternatives in the form of other forms of or less environmentally forms of hydrogen that are available to be produced. And so what we're producing domestically or looking to produce domestically um, is effectively a niche product that fetches a very high premium. The question is, you know, do you have an off taker for that? Yes or no. Firstly, you know, is it really worth that, that, that premium for buying green hydrogen produced all the way in Namibia? Um, and with that come a lot of other questions, for instance, um, we're unlikely to consume most of that domestically, if any of it. Um, once it gets exported, there's obviously large transport costs involved with that as well. So not only are there relatively high costs of production associated with Namibia in general, but then the transport costs to get it to the end user will also be quite high. Um, and so, you know, those, those, those really do throw a bit of a spanner in the works there. Another question for us is on the total macro benefits. Um, so the employment numbers are very, very large. Um, what we tend to see is, is that this looks to be a more capital intensive than labor intensive industry, similar to mining in Namibia. The, in, the entire mining industry in Namibia only employs around directly, excluding contractors, but directly around 10,000 um, persons. Um, so, you know, do we really expect to see as much in, uh, employment coming from as capital intensive an industry? And I, I think firstly, that's not likely to be the case. Secondly, um, the skills deficit is a challenge. Speak to anyone who needs to try and find a skilled worker in Namibia where skills aren't readily available here. The ability to find or to import skills is incredibly difficult. We make it difficult for businesses um, to bring skills in here and to, and, and to grow their own companies. Um, we follow a very sort of economic nationalist approach and saying, well, we must only hire Namibians. Um, and that really isn't the correct approach to take. So the question is, will we find those skills available here? If not, you know, the, the difficulty in getting those skills here might be a deterrent. If that isn't the case, if the exemptions are granted, well, then it's a tacit acknowledgement that, frankly, we need overall reforms and, and it isn't quite right to uh, allow these benefits to accrue to a single sector rather than the economy as a whole when we clearly see that there are reasons for it. Um, and so I think it's something that we need to be very worried about. And we see it coming through in policy as well. If we look at the investment promotion facilitation bill that was tabled um, late last year and then very quickly withdrawn, 
one of the uh, powers granted to the minister um, in that bill allows the minister to close economic sectors for various reasons, only allowing cert, uh, government to, uh, or the minister being able to choose, um, you know, who is able to play in which sector are Namibians allowed to, you know, uh, be active in this space or not. Only Namibians may be employed in this space or not. And that's very much the wrong approach we, that we're taking. And I think that is a huge investment deterrent in general, not just for a, a potential project like this. And lastly is on the time frame. Um, again, you know, we often speak about this like it's very nearby and it's many years away, five years away for production at best. Um, it's still not entirely tried and tested. Um, and so I think a lot of people will say, yes, you know, but people speak very differently about the extractive industries we see here, you know, a gold resource or an oil field. And the difference there is because when you've got a gold, when you've got gold oil, you know, what's in the ground and you can work with that already. You can leverage that um, because you know the potential that's already there. You can value it and you can and you can go to the bank with that and work with it from there. With this sort of project, it's not quite there yet. Um, the lead time is very long is a you know the benefits we will start to see will accrue only many years from now and the question for us is we see the economy has been in a difficult space for the last seven or eight years um you know we need an e economic recovery plan for the near term we need to get to 2025 um not you sort of hold up 2025 and say you know we hope to get there and then from there it will be all right uh, and so we need sort of a post-covid recovery plan and while green hydrogen might be an important role in that, it shouldn't be the recovery plan. Um, and so, you know, it's not to say that that green hydrogen is impossible. It shouldn't, you know, have any limelight in Namibia. But the question is the prominence that it does get um, within the country, within the development focus, within, within the growth focus. Um, is that really the best focus that we should be placing for the country's economic recovery path? Um, and so we think that it might not, you know, all the focus shouldn't be on there, but it does hit the sort of right mark, right? If we are able to turn around Namibia's uh, investment environment, the business environment, make it easier, not just for green hydrogen um, to start in Namibia, but for businesses in general to operate, to start operate in Namibia, easy to bring skills. And in fact, invite foreigners to bring their skills here and start their own businesses here. We can actually capitalize on Namibia's renewable energy potential as a green Namibia. There's obviously a lot of funding available for this sort of stuff globally. Namibia could still be a net export of energy, but it doesn't necessarily need to be focused on a very niche product. We could rather focus on broader economic reforms uh, and potentially capitalize on a broader industry in general, as opposed to one specific project. Um, and that brings my discussion to an end. Thanks. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, big thank you to all our panelists or experts. And we're going to open up the floor for some questions now. And I'm just going to hand over to our CEO, Mrs. Fritcher. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kai. And I think there are a lot of questions. Probably we cannot take all of them. We will take three or four from the floor. Then we'll go over to the Zoom people, there are around 40 people on Zoom who also post their questions, so bear with us. We'll really try to accommodate as many as possible. I can also say that we will have another panel discussion on the 23rd of February. I was contacted, in fact, today by um, the developers representative and some other stakeholders and they wanted to add to this and I said this is already the limit time wise and frame wise we will have another one. So for today I request that the questions be addressed to the three experts here, not to the developer as such, and then next time we focus on that one. Thank you so, so much if you could say who you are and who who you want to answer your question and then maybe someone else can add to it thank you i'll be quick i'm eddie turner and my question is probably to dr von utzen but let me just say thank you for organizing things like this for somebody coming from theology and coming to a fact-based session uh, it's really refreshing and so dr von utzen i think you might mention about there's a certain window of opportunity 
So I want to get more clarity on what is this window of opportunity for Namibia from a time frame perspective for us not to miss the boat. Thank you. Great question. Let me start with something of a philosophical point which you may or may not uh, find appropriate. Um, in, in times that are uncertain, um, in times that are uncertain, I would venture to say that if you're in a haste, do it slowly. In other words, you know, don't rush to something that you don't understand. And so this is exactly what we have at the moment that there is an in international hype in terms of green hydrogen. It is a tremendous opportunity. You know, the demand is going to start very quickly. But technology-wise, we also see just the uptake of innovations. So, you know, by, by assuming a slightly more diversified um, approach instead of a single track project initiative, we would have the ability to test certain and to, to roll out a number of uh, initiatives rather than tie ourselves to a single um, project. Now, you know, I don't want to um, say, you know, what the investment guys always say, you know, Robert and, and his people, uh, but, but I take information from them very seriously. So if you want to invest, spread or diversify, do not put all your eggs in one basket. It is a very sensible type of strategy. And that's exactly the strategy that I would propose for Namibia. So let me be specific in terms of projects that I would think are worthwhile and that can be pursued and that can also open up this development perspective or perspective that I think is, is missing in a single uh, approach project. What, what I could, for example, see is, you know, the mining industry in Namibia is, is a robust industry, well managed, it works well, we are generating good profits and we are creating jobs that are secure and that are often actually extremely well paid and it is one of our pivotal sectors in the country and uh, so i'm not just saying that because mark sits here but of course it is a fantastic uh, sector where we actually for a change see that we can do things with namibia's resources so we have iron ore resources in Namibia, namely at Dorabis and also in the Orongo region at Shiela. And uh, so there is a potential whereby we can use local mining enterprises to start on a much smaller scale in terms of using hydrogen to reduce the, uh, the iron ore that would be coming from Dorabis or from Shiela. Uh, into elemental iron. You know, this is called reduction. It's a chemical process that is called reduction. And, you know, in that way, we would do some value addition in Namibia. And we would do that value addition in a sector that is already strong. In other words, and that has an adaptive capacity and that has measures. And sorry to always point at you, Mark. I don't want to do this, but we, we have measures and management in place to actually benefit from these type of endeavors. So that is point one. The next point, of course, is, you know, this focus on electrical energy that we are importing that could in time be displaced by more renewables. You know, just picture this. We have this fantastic wind resource, but on our wind energy capacity is five megawatts only. You know, it, it is just out of this world. We have this fantastic solar regime that I spoke about, but our total installed capacity in terms of photovoltaics is of the order of 200 megawatt. Actually, it's a bit smaller. So, you know, this is tiny in comparison to what we could do. So instead of being this net importer, and of course, it is not just a matter of, you know, putting up solar panels and then, you know, generating this because we know that renewables such as solar and wind are intermittent, so they need to be managed in a way so as to make sure that they don't destabilize the grid. 
And so by a, we are part of the Southern African power pool region. And so trade arrangements in terms of us providing what we are actually competitively uh, positioned to provide at a good and competitive cost, namely solar and wind energy, that could easily trade and penetrate the Southern African power pool market. But that, of course, requires that we substantially invest in our transmission infrastructure and also, of course, in our generation infra infrastructure. So the message is, if you can use electricity immediately, then do it. Because, of course, the losses in an electrical system such as our transmission system are only about 10%. While if you go the route by way of hydrogen synthesis, you know, just making hydrogen costs one and a half times as much as what you can retrieve from the hydrogen. So by way of numbers, you know, I need about 50 kilowatt hours in electrical energy to, by way of electrolysis, produce one kilogram of hydrogen that is then worth 33 kilowatt hours. So, you know, you spend a lot of energy to get something that is transportable and useful. But if you can avoid these type of losses, go first the electric route. In other words, go full steam in terms of building your electricity infrastructure in terms of this. Now, I mentioned the mining sector. And of course, we have not even scratched the surface in terms of the potentials of operating big operators such as Usap Mine, Rossing Mine, that could do this in the Orongo region, Namdep and Deb Marine there at Oranjemon, they are in the sweet spot of wind. So, you know, there are local opportunities for gradually building and moving towards the zero carbon emission target. But it is then a more organic growth that we are looking at. And it is not this one project that needs to win the day and has such a long stick in terms of leverage when it comes to negotiation. So let me stop here. I hope that I've addressed some of these. And by the way, the, you know, the iron ore is only one example. Green zinc is another example. So we can do many of the processes in the mining sector by displacing fossil fuels uh, with hydrogen. But of course, it does not require those mammoth uh, capacities that we are talking about when we talk about the Southern Development Corridor Initiative. I hope that does. Do you want to add something? Thank you. Thank you so much, Bertchen. My name is Bertin Kors, uh, and I speak in uh, my capacity from Earth Life Namibia. My question is well, first of all, Ditlov, thank you very much that you emphasized the environmental impact so much. This is really very much on my heart, and, and uh, yeah, I'm pleased about it. Then uh, you mentioned underused uh, landscapes. Would you? see any other place where uh, this plant or this whole entire um, plant could be built? That would be one question. Then I have a technical question on with the electrolysis. On the one hand, you have the, the H2. On the other hand, you have uh, the oxygen. So what happens to the oxygen, will it be released into the atmosphere as ozone or, I don't know. And similar, um, if I understand the process correctly that H2 can be sort of stored in ammonia, so in NH3 for transport, for easier transport. Uh, but then does it need to be um, how would I say, released again from the ammonia? Um, and does that step um, produce a lot of nitrogen? And what happens to the nitrogen? Thank you. Thank you, Bertin. The first question is in terms of the plant locations. 
if you have plant locations that are specifically geared towards export, they would uh, by nature want to sit close to a harbor. So harbor facilities are absolutely critical. And we only have two harbors, the big one in Wolfers Bay and the small one in Lüderitz. And so these are the sort of natural locations where you would want to um, position yourself in terms of that. Now the Irongo region in terms of the solar and the wind regime is not as spectacular as Southern Namibia is. I mean, I'm talking about the Saukaib Park. Uh, but still, the Orongo region has very reasonable uh, solar irradiation values and also a wind regime, which is uh, lower, but um, it is still there. So, yes, you could uh, relocate or you could have this industry in, uh, in the Orongo region, but the scale uh, would, would certainly take a hit simply because of the fantastic wind resources that we have in the Sokai Park. Mm -hmm. You may remember the one um, sketch that I showed in terms of this red area with very, very high wind energy densities that, that unfortunately we don't have at Wolfis Bay. Now, in terms of uh, the second point, uh, back in the oxygen, um, let me just clarify. So a electro, uh, an electrolyzer is a very simple apparatus that has a cathode and an anode and you put a voltage difference between the cathode and the anode, and you put water into that as a medium and possibly a membrane uh, to speed up the process. And then your hydrogen collects at the, at the cathode and the oxygen at the anode. Now in this process, you would capture the hydrogen and you would release the oxygen. Now, there, there may be some minor uh, requirements or there may be some minor uses for oxygen, but usually you would just simply vent it into the air and that's it. Um, it is oxygen, we breathe it. It is not something that is uh, particularly um, environmentally uh, damaging or so. It, so it's not a significant concern at all. Uh, lastly, the, the question of the... Uh, ammonia. So ammonia, let me just say, is a fantastic storage medium for hydrogen, particularly if you want to store hydrogen for a long period or for long transport. So unlike, you know, if you were to transport hydrogen on a ship, say from, from Lüderitz to Europe somewhere, to Rotterdam or whatever, you would have to compress it, you would have to cool it, you know, the boiling point of hydrogen is minus 253 degrees centigrade, you know, that's kind of cool. And so, you know, it is a rather complex process and you have to keep it very cool and in that process, you would still have enormous losses um, in terms of hydrogen simply cooking off and disappearing. And in order to avoid these technical complexities, even though it can be done, you know, so hydrogen transfer by way of shipping can be done. But a much more elegant way of storing this, um, this energy of hydrogen is by way of combining it first with nitrogen from the air. So that uses the Haber-Bosch process, turns hydrogen and nitrogen from the air into NH3, that is ammonia, which can then be stored and which can be used as a fuel. And it has, you know, some really lovely characteristics other than the, you know, not that lovely characteristics that I also mentioned before. So let me not repeat it, but when you then come to a place and you need hydrogen, you then do, you basically do cracking. You crack the NH3 and you then separate, you know, the, the, um, the N from the H and you have hydrogen gas and you have uh, uh, the, the various um, other components. And the advantage of that process is of course that you can you know, do the cracking where you would need the hydrogen so that you do not have to transport the hydrogen for a long period. Uh, but you can also, you know, by way of using the ammonia directly in internal combustion engines, you can do that. Uh, so there are certain shipping engines, for example, or engines in the mining industry and so forth that can drive directly on ammonia. But ammonia has many other uses. We have um, Natango here with us. He's a chemist, I believe. 
And so, you know, if I give him the microphone in terms of all the uses, we, we will not get to the end of the evening, but there are many uses, including, you know, explosives, uh, you know, fertilizers. It is a rather interesting substance and can be used for uh, many, many purposes in the chemical industry and uh, in various other industries. So it would have applications in the mining sector in Namibia in terms of ammonium nitrate explosives. It would have applications in terms of fertilizers. If you uh, you can use ammonia directly, or you can use it, or process it into an NPK uh, fertilizer. So there are quite a number of options available. So it is rather a versatile product, and if you if we can uh, produce it on large scale, it is very useful, um, and it has it would have many uses in Namibia as well. So it's it's certainly the route that is these days seen as a much more viable route um, instead of piping um, or shipping hydrogen. Let me stop here. Mr. Yagao and then Dr. Dupizani, and then we go over to the Zoom question, and then we come back to the floor. Thank you. My name is Rainer Yago. I'm a happy pensioner, so I'm not representing anybody. Um, maybe just a little bit of criticism. If we, if we listen today to the presentations, I wonder if anybody walks out here today and say we should still go for green hydrogen. Um, therefore, I think it's important that the developers get the chance at the same forum because all of us are going to work out with pre walk out today with preconceived ideas. And it's very difficult once you establish an idea to actually revert it in, in the next presentation. Some of us might not even be present. So please, uh, from to the scientific society, invite the hyphen in this case. If they don't want to go, go to, to the uh, developer forum, developing the private sectors to state their side of the story. Um, that love to your, to your side. Um, so it's, no, it's more comments than questions, actually. Um, strategic environment uh, assessments. Yes, they're extremely important. We need to do it. But here's a chicken and the egg situation. Um, you're expecting answers, which the developers, Hive in this case, still have to give in this two-year period, or most probably going to be longer. I can't see them concluding the feasibility study in two years' time. But give them the, the chance to come up with these answers. It's a duty on us to present at the public forums, ask the right questions. Then um, the next thing is um, what government needs to do here mainly is negotiate the agreements. There's so much which can be given in kind not just necessarily in concessional fees, because we don't know what's going to happen to that money. But in kind, name power can get energy, name water can get water, and so, uh, 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 and, and so forth. And I think there is a market um, in Namibia for green hydrogen if it's uh, commercially viable. I mean, the green hydrogen is not commercially viable in Germany. We all know that. It's going to be funded initially through a, through a government fund until the two meet each other, similar to what the Mason has done on the green, uh, on the solar projects in Morocco. Um, to you, uh, uh, Robert, um, I would like to know, we we promoting mines and development markets, not against you, sir. <laughs> but um, when are mines starting to pay taxes? Because on, on, your, on your slide is, is more how Namibia features negatively. But um, all I know is that that resting took many, many, many years before some um, co uh, company tax flew into Namibian coffers. So it doesn't help. I've got a mining activity, and all which goes is, 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 is payee and uh, per local purchases. So I would like to, to maybe if you can include it as a line item into your, into your, uh, into your slides. Let me see if I got more. I think that's, that's enough for, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for these comments. And, and I see them as comments and I certainly value your opinion on that one. In terms of the strategic environmental assessment, my view would, would be very clear that we start with it ASAP. We cannot have the developer do this type of uh, thing. This needs to be by independent persons who do this professionally and separate from the specific initiatives. So 
I'm looking specifically at our development um, partners. And of course, I'm not suggesting that it is um, so the KFW, the GIZs of the world, the BGRs, and so forth, they would surely find a reasonable, given the interest that Germany has, and given Minister Karliczek's, you know, exuberant uh, entrance in Namibia when she signed the deal with Albert Kandiose last year in terms of $40 million support to Namibia, 40 million euros, by the way. Uh, you know, that is part of the funding offers that should, in my view, be invested in a strategic environment assessment, not the entire, some, of course. But that is seed funding that we should be channeling in parts to have an independent assessment of what the total cumulative impacts would be not just the environmental impacts, but the impacts as a whole. And so this is, it's a good time. It is good that it does take quite some time uh, for the developer to come forward with the final concept. And I agree, it is very ambitious and I cannot see that they will have all the due diligence, this, you know, the I's dotted and the T's crossed on 10 billion US dollars or 9.4, sorry. Uh, that, that I simply don't see, but that is the window of opportunity that we have to actually start a strategic environmental assessment. And it is not that we haven't done this before. There are precedents in how this can be done. The Ministry of Mines and Energy would be well advised to do that, particularly if we see this happening in combination with what we currently hear Shell and the oil explorers doing in the coast and also starting or being to be in production by 2026. So, you know, this is not just one tsunami we are talking about suddenly, we are talking about two, two tsunamis coming. And in my view, we better be prepared for that. And so I'm not suggesting that the golden bullet is a strategic environmental assessment, but it is to actually pull together the expertise to have a level-headed assessment to tell us what is likely to pan out. So maybe a word of, of question also to Dr. Chris Brown, who I see in the back there, that Chris would surely, and I'm not suggesting that I prescribe to you what to do, but I think for the Namibian Environmental Chamber, that could be something to initiate. That's my private opinion. Robert, you want to add to the comment on tax? Um, firstly, I think a very good point just on, uh, you know, listening to the other side of the story as well. I think that is useful. I mean, we're, my job as an, as an analyst is to ask questions and look at the numbers. And, uh, and so um, this is sort of just some of the questions we have. On the mining side, I mean, I'm not here to, to, to uh, present on the uh, extractive industry. I think if you... Um, had a look at some of the work we did with the budget speech last year. We, you know, we we were somewhat critical. We, the, the mining companies, a lot of them, don't pay much tax. Haven't paid corporate tax in a long time, and and I think that sort of can maybe raise a debate on sort of you know is that the way to go or not. Um, but I, I still think you know, irrespective of of whether uh, the sort of tax regime ap uh, applied to um, corporate uh, to mining companies, they firstly face a much higher corporate tax rate. Um, so your diamond mining companies at what 55% non diamond mining at 37.5%. Um, the average corporate tax rate number before non mining companies at 32%. We saw South Africa last year announced that they will be reducing this from 28% to 27% this year, um, which is a slightly positive move. If we look at Namibia's tax breakdown, um, or tax revenue breakdown, rather, um, most of Namibia's corporate tax comes from, say, the couple of the, the four major commercial banks and probably two or three mining entities. Um, we could very easily reduce our corporate tax rate as an idea, not to say we must or we should, but just an idea. Uh, corporate tax makes up a very small amount of government's total tax revenue. Um, you know, reducing the corporate tax rate substantially to say below South Africa or so below most of our neighbors sends a very positive message to say, look, you know, it's, it's easier to generate a return here. We might not have the market size available for you, but at least, you know, when you make a, an ethical profit, um, you can get more of that at the end of the day. Um, and we don't sacrifice a particularly large amount of government's tax revenue for that. So um, I think, you know, the, the, the corporate tax rate is one thing. Yes, corporate should be paying tax and then, and, and 
um, you know, we need a, a fair and reflective regime that, that approaches that. But at the same time, you know, um, seeing a very high corporate tax rate, now introducing a, a dividend withholding tax in a small economy um, with a very small market size, you've got all these hurdles to trying to start and run and open your business, maintain it, the regulatory burdens, you know, the difficulty in finding people that you need or getting people that you need here. Um, these things all add up at the end of the day and it makes it very difficult. Um, so it's not to say that, for instance, Hyphen or whoever might not want to do it here, um, you know, they might have looked at it and said, we're willing to go through that. And, and that's great if they do. Um, the challenge is, you know, if, if they look at it and say, well, you know, because this project has such prominence and they might not have to jump all the same through all the same hoops, you know, why is it that everyone else will need to do the same? Um, and so I think we really need to ask a lot more difficult questions around, you know, these are small improvements that we can make to sort of get the economy as a whole on the right track as opposed to uh, having a lot of attention drawn on one project um, if effectively putting our eggs in one basket to sort of uh, see huge economic change. Thank you so much. Before we go to Dr. Dubizani's question, Natanga will comment. It's Dr. Natanya Shapira. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about the perspectives of green hydrogen economy, I think it's also important to look at the pros and cons for the fossil-based fuel, which is the existing industry, and the green hydrogen industry, which we are pursuing. So should we, when we are looking at the pros, the bushfire that is happening in Australia, killing hyenas and destroying forests, can that be, we must also compare, if we are to have a green hydrogen industry having wind turbines that are killing birds. So I, I think that is bad. And then by then you will arrive at which industry should be the focus. Because I think there is no human activity that has no impact on the environment. But I think what is important is to minimize the impact. And I think that is the road we must think about. Thank you very much. Professor Dupizani. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, for a wonderful, fresh, uh, stimulating evening. I think I'm going to look at it as a philosopher, not that I'm a particularly good one, but uh, it's important to do that. I think one of the major problems we have with these mega project approaches is that they fail to make distinctions between what would be necessary to do and what is contingent in the projects. The problem is that uh, if something is necessary, it has to be done, it is true, irrespective of the conditions. So it's clear from your presentations that from a necessary perspective, there are things that can be done almost immediately scaling up on the technologies and the capacities that we have here, uh, like solar energy, wind energy, and so on and so forth. But the contingencies of these mega projects are so considerable, not only the financial risks and the management risks and the other issues, environmental risks and so on, that they really should not be entertained, especially not by small states like ours. We should have learned what is happening globally. And I think, you know, it, it really, for me, it's a deeply disturbing development. Not that I'm an expert in energy, far from it. I'm an expert in nothing. Um, I'm a lover of many things, but not an expert in any. But the problem is Namibia doesn't seem to learn fundamentally what has gone wrong in other arenas and other jurisdictions in the world. We repeat the same things. And it's got to do with our political culture. And it's got to do with a kind of projection of Namibia. We are always fighting above our weight. We always try to play as a global player, ego-centered politics, big man politics, legacy politics. You know, instead of looking at politics as a soft science in terms of the needs of our people, the sustainability that the environment provides, and so on and so forth. So I'm afraid if we go down this route, uh, it's like 
Recon Africa is the same story. It's the same logic that drives Recon Africa. Unfortunately, it drives this project. Although they are different projects, completely different. But the logic of that is the same. And that's the problem. And we need to deal with that as Namibians. Nobody else can deal with that. Thank you so much for this valuable analyzing comment. Over to the Zoom. There we go. Can you read? Could I read? Cecilia Pretorius, my question to Dr. von Erzen is why Namibia has taken so long to harness the massive potential of renewable energy available and what plans are there in place to do so over the next few years? Thank you very much for that question. I have asked myself exactly the same for many, many years. Um, but, but there is a silver lining here. And uh, I say that um, with the potential of, of there being repercussions for me again. But Andre Dupisani will know exactly what it is that if we open our mouths, then sometimes it has repercussions. So Andre, thank you very much, first of all, for your very insightful statement, which, which I have nothing to add to because, uh, you know, it's actually the sort of closing statement that um, would have been, maybe you can have a word of closing at the end as well. Uh, your wisdom is certainly appreciated. Um, so let me get back to the practical issues. Why has it taken so long? So the silver lining that we have at the moment is that suddenly, for the first time, I believe, in these last 32 years in Namibia, the renewable energy riches are suddenly have been recognized by state house. So to me personally, this is almost like a phase change. You know, we have always been talking about it and there are some very senior pioneers in terms of the renewable energy revolution in Namibia, like Conrad Rodan right, right at the back there. Um, we have spoken about this for, for many, many years and have spoken about this enormous potential that it has and the enormous power that it could have for driving the Namibian economy, but we have never been entirely successful and so if, if there is one silver lining for me, it is that this message has finally arrived in State House. And that is something that I take joy in. You know, as a Namibian, I take joy in that finally certain things are no longer seen as, you know, just, you know, these little experiments by, you know, some weirdos. Now, in terms of going forward, you know, how can we harness this? Now, this is, this is something that is entirely uh, the mandate of the Ministry of Mines and Energy, namely the Minister of Mines and Energy. It has a, what we call an integrated resource plan, and that plan is, is drawn up every couple of years. I happen to be an author of that a couple of years ago, and it was uh, revised and updated just last year and will be finalized um, probably within the next month or so. And so that integrated resource plan is a plan to secure Namibia's electricity supply over a 20 year period, which is a very good period because we need certain investment horizons in terms of these long term investments in transmission grids in uh, capacity or so you cannot just snap your hand and then it's there it takes years to develop these type of things. Now, unfortunately, you know, the philosophy behind the integrated resource plan has often been focused very much on, you know, in the past it was on Kudu, and then it is on, you know, some other fossil and so forth. Um, I would hope that we would actually see a, um, can I use the word reimagining, a reimaging? Um, you know, I've, I've borrowed it and uh, I'm not quite astute in its use, but Andre, you can surely help me with saying it correctly. But I think if we were to be bold enough to, for a change, re-image what resources we have and what we could do in future, then there is actually good scope. In terms of the specific initiatives undertaken by independent power producers and by NAM power. That is something that is laid down by the Minister of Mines and Energy. So Tom Alwendo is the person who says, so he makes a so-called ministerial determination and says, 
independent power producers can serve so much in terms of capacity and then power can do so much. And so, you know, that is very much the, the mandate and it is the requirement of the minister to lay down that plan based on the integrated resource plan. So it is not for NAM power or it is not for an individual supplier to decide I'm going to do that, but it is a more grand picture and it is firmly in the hands of the minister as the custodian of the energy sector. Thank you. Then we get to Dr. Dieter Murach all the way from the coast. If we think about the local use of hydrogen, are the Namibian consumers of hydrogen willing to pay the same price for hydrogen as the European consumers? Does Lüdritzburg's better wind and solar capacity balance the greater difficulty of transporting it for export? I don't see the primary market for green hydrogen in Namibia, but in Europe for export. However, we need a port so that we can ship the hydrogen. Is Lüdritzburg suitable for this? Sorry to my fellow panelists. Um, I will try and do some, some justice to this question. Um, the current market for hydrogen is minute in Namibia. And unless we take deliberate steps to create markets and create an offtake for hydrogen, it is going to remain very, very small. Um, how do I know? I have had several clients for whom we did assessments on green hydrogen uh, in the year before last and in last year, looking specifically in terms of the potentials to, to actually switch to green hydrogen and the associated costs. And this was not the hydrogen supply by a major um, provider, but it was done on a much small, smaller scale. So basically it was a online production process and so forth, which uh, in certain ways makes sense. But the market will remain relatively constrained and relatively small. And the, um, Mr. Moroch, uh, or Dr. Moroch, I wouldn't know, um, in fact is perfectly right that the local markets are unfortunately small. In time, the regional markets, particularly in South Africa, may develop, but we should not underestimate that the South Africans also have a deep technical base and can very quickly turn these projects into reality as well, and they are busy with it. So it's not that, you know, we are the only ones, uh, the, the only bright kid on the block who can do this type of thing. In fact, it is not the case. So um, I would not see that uh, a significant production of hydrogen, such as envisaged by Hyphen, is for the Namibian market, not at all. And uh, of course, in terms of the export and suitability of Luderitz, uh, if Luderitz is going to be used, there needs to be an extension. And my, it is my understanding that as part of the request for proposal, there was actually a triple P approach in terms of the harbor extension. Um, I am not fully clued up on all the details of the harbor extension at Luderitz, but it is certainly on the cards as well. Um, so that means the facility is not yet uh, suitable for it, but it could be developed into one. Of course, that requires additional um, substantial finances to do so, but in principle, that could be, could be um, brought about. Thank you so much. I wanted one last question, but my colleague insists that there's another one. So it's this one and one more. And then we close. Sakira, is anyone perhaps wondering at what stage of the development hyphen is? Perhaps they are awaiting the Namibian government input and finalization before they begin assessments of the sensitive Sperrgebiet. It would be unethical to enter into a place and begin assessments without consent. Who will respond to this one? So we take it as a very smart comment. I like it. Yes. How does the investment of green hydrogen compare to the investment in solar to produce 3.4 um, terawatt hour or the investment to produce the 10 gigawatt from wind turbines? Perhaps we should first invest first in solar and wind to produce energy in phase one, and then we move on to green hydrogen. I think we pretty covered that. You want to... Um, say anything anymore. And with this, 
I especially thank our panelists. Thank you, Dr. von Erzen. Thank you, Jackie Scholz. Thank you, Robert McGregor. Um, we have asked them if we could keep the PowerPoint presentations. They will be worked into a YouTube video. Give us two, three days to finish this into a nice YouTube. If you want to listen to the recording tomorrow, you can send us a mail or come with the USB stick, although the recording is so big that it's not easy to put it on a USB stick. So we rather send it via Smash or WeTransfer, or you can ask for the specific slides of a panelist, or you wait until we publish the YouTube video, probably by end of the week. I say thank you for your participation. I say thank you for the debate. I say thank you that these things become clearer and clearer. As I said, we will have at least one more panel discussion on the 23rd. We also have questions on the table. What will happen to the avine environment? Easy question. How is it going to impact bird life at the coast? This just being one of the environmental concerns. And we will slowly but surely try to address as many as possible.